themes too. Um, let me know, by the way, if, if anything's not working. So you guys, I'm gonna start my presentation with a screen share that, and some slides that get to this very question. Okay, so without any further ado, here we go. So um, uh, I, I, I'm, I answer this question, you know, when, or the, or, or the um, sort of the puzzle about when the U.S. became interested in Cuba with, with Thomas Jefferson. I always begin this way. Um, and uh, I call the, this presentation, this little heuristic, uh, the view from Monticello. Um, and, and I'm gonna say a little bit more about Jefferson, but let me first sort of put you all on this spot and ask you if you know what this is. Um, you know, Tom, you can see people. I don't know if you'll unmute them if they raise your, their hand, but does anybody recognize that tableau? Nope. It's not, it, Tom, do you recognize that? It's no, not a, it's no, not no. A test, and I, my intent is not to put anybody on the spot. But um, this is Mount Vernon, right? Oh. One of America's civic shrines. Increasingly problematic, right, as we're revisiting the founders. But um, my next question, of course, is, does anybody know where Mount Vernon got its name? And I imagine you, like I, me, before I took up this project, did not. But, but the, the, this shrine, this civic shrine of the United States, got its name from the British Admiral that George Washington's half-brother Lawrence served with in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, for three months in 1741. Just let's sit on that for a second. So no, US Cuban politics, US interest in Cuba <laughs> did not begin in 1959. We've been interested in it and in it ourselves physically for literally centuries. Um, so so the, the name of this farm, this plantation before it became Mount Vernon was named Ep Epsawasan. And George Washington's half-brother changed the name after a long friendship with Vernon in Guantanamo and elsewhere. So why was, why was George Washington's half-brother in Guantanamo in 1741? It's, it's sort of a long and complicated story. Um, and I will try to, to cut it really short. But if you look at this map and, and you see a line called the watershed boundary, that's the, the boundary between the, the Allegheny Mountain Ridge, between the, the, the Tidewater colonies, the Tidewater Territory, and the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley. Um, and, and in 1700s, in the seven, 1730s, 1740s, though we can't really imagine it, the colonies that were in that narrow band between the watershed boundary and the Atlantic felt squished and were undergoing population pressures that had to do with a number of factors and economic growth. But among others, there was pressure on the Allegheny Ridge from the French, and there was pressure on the Atlantic seaboard from the Spanish. And these colonists felt squished. They were, of course, British colonists at the time, but this expedition that Washington joined in what was called then, curiously, the War of Jenkins Ear, was uh, an attempt by the British to relieve pressure on these colonies to attack some of the, the Spanish bastions and, and contest the Spanish control of the Atlantic and the Caribbean at the time. Um, so there was a need, a felt need from these Americans, right, that they wanted to expand. Some were interested in going into the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley and settling that as they eventually would and some wanted to settle elsewhere uh, in other parts of the Caribbean and, and the North American continent. Um, so th th this is super interesting, but if, 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 if you wanna harvest the resources of this breadbasket, the Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio River Valleys, right? You weren't gonna grow agricultural uh, products there and, and haul them over the Allegheny Mountains. It was simply too hard. The best way to reap the harvest of the, that, that area was to take it down the rivers, the Allegheny, Ohio, Mississippi River, ultimately to the port of New Orleans, right? But the port of New Orleans at this time was in, in, in control of the French 
and much of Florida was in control of the Spanish. So this was just a problem that these guys knew about. But uh, I, I'm not making this up. Benjamin Franklin was, uh, was a, uh, a uh, owner of something called the Vandalia Company. Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's dad, Peter, was a part owner of something called the Loyal Land Company. These are London-based companies. George Washington's half-brother, Lawrence himself, was an owner of something called the Ohio River Company of Virginia. And all these guys had their eye on the interior of the continental United States, right? Then in control of other, other countries. But they all knew that if they wanted to, again, reap the harvest of that territory, they needed to control the waterways. Now look at this, this is fascinating. This too, these guys knew. So here again, you see the Allegheny Range, which makes is the barrier to simply taking that, those goods across, the, across to the coast. But if you look, you can see where roughly New Orleans is on this map. I have my cursor. I don't know if my cursor works for you, but it's yeah, down. Yeah, it does. Right? Um, uh, and, and if you want to, so if you want to reap the harvest of, those, of that territory, you have to control those rivers. To control those rivers, you have to have access to the port of New Orleans. If you want to have access to the port of New Orleans, you have to control the Gulf of Mexico. This is the age of wind and sail and current, right? If you want to control the Gulf of Mexico, you have to control the, the Caribbean Sea. Let me go back to this slide. Current in the Gulf of Mexico goes clockwise. It enters through the Windward Passage and other passages this way through the, on the Atlantic, comes into the Gulf, right through the Yucatan's, uh, straight, Yucatan Channel, comes this way and exits through the Florida Straits. These guys knew that. So if you wanted to reap the harvest of all this territory here, literally the, United, the, the central uh, part of what is now the United States, the breadbasket, you had to control the rivers, you had to control New Orleans, you had to control the Gulf, and you had to control these passages, the windward passage on which sits Guantanamo, the Yucatan Channel, and also the Florida Straits. And these guys knew that. Um, I, I called in, in the Guantanamo book, this area, the, the, the heart and filter of Atlantic commerce. And it's not an exaggeration. I'll show you some quotes from some of the founders. But so to answer Tom's question, no, we didn't suddenly get, get uh, interested in Cuba when a guy named Fidel Castro showed up in 1959. The founders of the country thought that the country could not prosper unless we controlled Cuba. And they wanted us to control Cuba because of this system of current wind and, and, and the trade system that it was part of, uh, which they knew absolutely about as early as probably even the, the late 1700s, never mind, I mean the late 1600s, never mind that late, the early 1700s. So let me show you um, another one. So here, here's Cuba, and again, right at the heart of it, because I'll show you these quotes and you'll see why Cuba is so important. Um, here's, here's Guantanamo Bay, which was the, sort, the, the subject of one of my books right here. But this is the Windward Passage, generally acknowledged to be the most important passage in the Caribbean Sea. It sits on what's called the Cayman Trench right here. Um, all right, so witness Thomas Jefferson to James Monroe, 1823. I candidly confess, he wrote, that I have ever looked at, on Cuba as the most inter interesting addition which could ever be made to our system of states. The control which with Florida Point, meaning the Florida Peninsula, then under the in possession of, of Spain, this island would give us, actually now we had just gotten it two year, a couple of years earlier. This island would give us over the Gulf of Mexico and the countries in the isthmus bordering on it, as well as all those waters that flow into it, would fill up the measure of our political well-being. Here's President Monroe to his friend Jefferson. I've always concurred with your, you in sentiment that too much importance could not be attached to Cuba and that we ought, if possible, to incorporate it into our union, availing ourselves of the most favorable moment for it. For I consider Cape Florida and Cuba as forming the mouth of the Mississippi and other rivers emptying into the Gulf of Mexico within our limits as of the Gulf itself. And in consequence that the acquisition of it to our union was of the highest importance to our internal tranquility 
as well as to our prosperity and aggrandizement. These guys didn't pull their punches, right? They were, they were imperialists. Jefferson liked to call himself a liberal, uh, uh, his idea of, of the United States as an empire of liberty. But there's no, no, no second guessing the emphasis on empire. Empire, empire, building, uh, 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 expansion for the tranquility and aggrandizement of the American people. Finally, Adams, Secretary of State John Adams to, to uh, I forget to, to whom, maybe, maybe to, Je uh, to Jefferson, uh, may, I don't know, to Monroe maybe. It's scarcely possible to resist the conviction that the annexation of Cuba to our federal public will be indispensable to the continuance and integrity of the union itself. Just as laws of political as well as physical gravitation demonstrate that an apple severed by a tempest from its native tree cannot choose but to fall to the ground, so Cuba, forcibly disjoined from its own unnatural contention, connection rather to Spain and incapable of self-support can gravitate only toward the North American Union, which by the same law of nature cannot cast her off from its bosom. So I'll stop there for a second, a second end, the, end, the, end the screen share, um, you know, and open it up a little bit to uh, Tom, I'm sure you have some follow-up questions, but no, the U.S. Uh, uh, interest in Cuba did not begin in, in 1959 with the triumph of the Cuban Revolution. Well, uh, well, what I'm going to do, Jonathan, is I have a, I've been playing around with Zoom, so I have a little bit, I have a poll here, uh, so I'm launching it, and let me know if you see it. Uh, the first one, I'm, the first question I ask for our participants is, what do they think is the most significant event in Cuban history? And then the second one. Um, I think I'd like to see if we could use this to maybe something that you can speak to, uh, Professor, about uh, some of these figures. You know, I think, I don't know how familiar many Americans are with William Shafter, Platt Amendment, the Dance of Millions, or Guantanamo. So I was just curious to see um, what people have to say uh, about, those type of, about those things. And, okay, well, it's interesting right now. It's... Uh, Right now, the Platt Amendment is leading by a wide margin, 50, 57%, good. Dance of Millions at 20, 20%, so. So yeah, it looks like the Platt Amendment is the big one here, uh, 67%, so I think almost all of our participants are, are, picking, are picking that. Um, and then again, um, for the first question, uh, we have the Spanish-American War, 15% people say that is the most significant event in Cuban history. Platt Amendment is 23%. And uh, the July 26th attack on the Moncada barracks, 0%. I think that's something that many Americans just don't know. In uh -huh. fact, you know, I, and you probably know this too, is whenever I, I bring American, uh, Americans to Cuba, they don't know what July 26th means. And so that, I found that very interesting. And, uh, and I enjoyed um, your, 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 you addressing that too in, 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 the, in the Young Castro book. Mm -hmm. um, looks like we're almost done with the polling almost everyone is finished and it looks like 62% have, have said that, uh, um, that they would like you to, to address, it would be uh, the Platt Amendment. Okay. And, um, and then no one, I don't think, again, let's look at it this way. No one chose a Teller Amendment. I don't know how many people actually know about the Teller Amendment. I didn't know that until I read your book. So, okay. uh, so, so let me say a couple things here. Um, to just to link it to Castro, um, I, make, I, I make a plea at the beginning of the book. I don't know if any of you have been able to, to take a look at the book yet, but for, for Americans to sort of suspend their idea of, of, of Castro, if I asked you to close your eyes and picture the guy, I'm curious to know what you would picture. My guess is you would picture the bearded uh, 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 guy clad in military fatigues with his finger gesticulating at the, uh, violently foaming at the mouth. Um, but in fact, the Castro that I discovered is very different. And he became that guy that we know in part, I would argue, because of this history, because in part of the history of the Platt Amendment and its ties to the Teller Amendment and its ties to the, to the um, Spanish-American War, which of course was originally the Cuban War of Independence. Um, so I, I won't say a lot about this. Uh, so you can, uh, I, I, I wanna give some shorter answers so you can get to some of your questions, Tom. <laughs> Sure. Um, but very quickly, you guys, when um, the U.S. declared war on, on, uh, on Spain, 
um, intervening very late in the in the Cuban War of Independence, when it was, in my my argument, virtually won. Um, when we declared war on on Spain in April of 1898, we we there was a we attached a rider to the legislation to the declaration of war that pledged to leave Cuba to its own devices after that war, which contradicted a whole century of U.S. ideas about the the importance of Cuba to the United States. Some of which I shared with you from Jefferson, Monroe, Adams, and others. But they were not alone, and that conversation continued throughout the 19th century right up to the war itself. So no one can, <laughs> can really account for the Teller Amendment. They're like, holy cow, I thought that that's why we were going into this war. So there was a little bit of, bit, a bit of nobility, it, it seemed, to America's declaration there that we were going to help the Cubans succeed, overthrow Spain, and get the hell out. Well, so very quickly, Spain capitulated, and then suddenly the old desires of the United States began to assert themselves. Let me give you some examples. Um, after the, at the, at the very ar armistice in July of 1898, uh, the United States did not let the Cuban army attend the armistice in Santiago de, C de Cuba. General Shafter that Tom alluded to was the general in charge, and he did not trust the Cubans themselves <laughs> to attend their own victory over Spain. Literally, they weren't allowed, right? A little bit later that, later that year, fast forward a couple months, and, and the U.S. did not invite the Cubans to attend the Treaty of Paris, whereby the fate of Cuba was to be decided now by the United States and not by the Cubans themselves. So the Cuban generals, the Cuban people were absolutely dismayed by this and they could not believe it. They thought that they had fought valiantly with an ally once the U.S. joined this almost over war. And what they discovered was that the U.S. weren't going to allow them to be the agents here and to decide the fate of their own country. Um, so then very quickly, the U.S. was all, the, the U.S. political figures, um, and by now Teddy Roosevelt was in power and, and, and uh, Major General Leonard Wood was in charge of Cuba, were very interested to, in trying to figure out what the U.S. could do to overcome Teller, overcome that pledge of Teller. And what they came up with was another legislative uh, vehicle called the Platt Amendment, which we insisted Did he lose internet? I think he, it, it froze, I think. It looks like he froze. Yep. We'll, just have to, we'll just have to wait until he um, comes back on. But it looks, uh, it looks like everyone else is still, uh, their internet connection still, is still okay. So uh, let's see, let's give, him a, let's give him a few seconds, see what happens. Um, I think we have, uh, let's see. Okay, well. Uh, it happens with technology sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, let's see. I think he's probably going to have to turn it off and then uh, turn it on again. But while while we're waiting for him to come on, uh, come back on, I just want to let you know uh, our next guest speaker is on August third. Her name is uh, Fatima Largaspada. She's a Nicaraguan fencer. In fact, she's on here watching right now. So I just want to say hello, Fati. And I look forward to you uh, talking about fencing and about saber, uh, saber fencing and your, your, your aspirations for the Olympic Games in 2021. So she will talk with us about her sport and about how she's getting ready for the Olympic Games in 2021. So that's on August 3rd, same time, 2 o'clock p.m. And then we have some other guests coming. Well. There we go. Good. He's back. I think. Hey, Tom. Oh. Oh, hi, Walt, Walter. Hi, Greg. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. It, I guess we're all, uh, we're all getting here. Hi, Daniela. <laughs> so, looks like he's had some kind of, uh, let me check my email. Let's see, I think he had some. Uh, uh, he's become Walter Lippman. Uh, I think so. Mm, let's see. In the meantime, I'll see if I can, I'm trying to get, um, I had a nice little, Oh shoot! There you go. Let's see if, if you can if this will work or not. 
All right, can, can you all see this slide I have or no? No. No, shoot. No, it's not coming through, Tom. Uh, it, let's see. Uh, no, some, something that's too bad. Uh, I don't know what's going on anyway. Uh, there's someone is, uh, someone speaking Spanish. There we go. I think, all right. I think it was, uh, I think, I think I took care of it. I think Walter was uh, talking with someone. I think I recognize it, his Spanish, so we'll have to see what happens. Um, but you anyway. Have, uh, the professor's number, maybe we could text him or chat. And uh, I think he's, I'll try and call him. Uh, let's see. All right, he's contacting me right now. Okay, no, that's someone else. Uh, let's see. Um, let me see if I can call him and uh, we'll find out what's going on because it was going well until yeah. just a, a minute ago. So let's see. Okay. All right, here we go. I got it. calling right now. All right, let's see what happens. Okay, he's uh, he's working uh, his way back, uh, so we, we'll have to see um, what happens. Um, anyway, um, let's see. We, we all have enough, enough uh, good interest in, in Cuba, and I he's going to be talking about this, but if you guys have a chance to read it, this is called uh, Young Fidel. I mean, Young Castro. It's a very interesting book, and uh, I've learned quite a bit about, about Cuban history uh, through that book. So if you have a chance to read that, and also Guantanamo and American History is also a very good book. Uh, most Americans don't know about Guantanamo, so I think that's also uh, uh, something very, very good to uh, to, to look at. Um, we will have to see. I think he's calling me right back. Hold on for a minute. Hello. All right, he's, uh, I think he's back on right now. He said he's just uh, logging on again, so. Okay, let's see. Hmm. Uh, Professor Hansen, can you hear me? Hmm. Okay, well, you know, I'd sing for you, but I can't sing, so we're not going to do that, but, uh. That is really, really strange. But anyway, just while he's getting on here, one of the things I'll tell you, one of the questions I'm going to ask him for all of you, you know this in the States now, with all the movement now to try and uh, to raise and take down some of these Confederate uh, stat statues, he's I'm going to ask him this question because in, in Cuba, they have a similar incident, a, a situation with, uh, what's the name? Jose Miguel Gomez was a president of Cuba. And in 1912, he committed, he ordered the massacre of several thousand Afro-Cubans. But then years later, they built this monument to him. It's a beautiful monument. I had the picture, but I can't upload it for some reason. But now the Cubans are having that very same conversation. They look, should we get rid of this? Um, get rid of this monument. And some people are saying, like the same, it's the same conversation we're having here. Oh, we need to have it. It's historical, blah, blah, blah. Other people are saying, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, you're commemorating an evil person. So I'm going to ask Professor Hansen that question. We'll see, we'll see what he thinks, uh, because it, it, it's it's a very big hot topic now in Cuba right now. So it's interesting how these things uh, how these things happen. Uh, let's see. Tom, Tom, why why is uh, Professor Hansen coming through with Walter Lippmann? I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? Oh, there he is. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, guys, Welcome I apologize back. for that. I've been zooming all spring and I've never been cut off. Um, but, but lucky for you that I was. Um, 
So with this question, I mean, I'm dying to hear from the students. I don't have, um, I have an opinion about this, but I'm not sure that it tracks my historical expertise. First of all, I, I would say that in the United States, this is my feeling that I understand, right, that these statues and schools and things like that can be a go to condition. I did to change the name of the Woodrow Wilson School. They said it was inappropriate. Um, a lot of this that were erected in the in a period of Jim Crow are coming down. And I agree that I think a lot of those were in some ways a form of terrorism. Like they were erected to keep the people in their place, to keep African Americans, freed men and women in their place historically. So I think many of those should come down. Um, I don't know much about this yeah, uh, that, professor. You know, the, and statues. Sorry. No, sorry. You're, you're fading in and out. I think now. Now it looks like it's cleared up. So, so I was. Can you can you hear me fine, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Wow. This is the this is the cost of this um, the COVID right that we the, these yeah. presentations are skewed. Uh, what I started to say was, I, I don't know enough about the period when it was put up and what Cubans think of it. I think it really matters from, you know, from the, from the perspective naturally of the, of the citizens of the country that itself. I'll say that this, that, that, you know, these statues are not sacred. They go up in a historical time. They may, may, may make less sense in another historical time or epoch. Um, I think that, that at, you know, sort of, even though the, they're, they're painful at their, at, the, at their painful best, they can pr uh, promote discussion. On the other hand, they can cause a lot of pain. And I guess I would, I would side on, uh, on the side of the people who, um, who, who, are, get, or, who are made to feel um, degraded by those statues and, 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 you know, suggest that a lot of them, I think, should, should come down. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to know what the, you and the, and the students say about that. Well, we, we do have one question, uh, Professor Hansen. It's from uh, Andy Sparks. He says, uh, well, what about the Christopher Columbus memorials in Cuba, like the cemetery? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> There's a small question. Um, I, I, I would turn, you know, the, when I'm asked this que the questions like this in class, I turn them around. I don't know. What, what does, was it Jeremy Sparks? What does he say? Uh, Andy, Andy Sparks, yeah. Andy Sparks. Andy, um, you unmute and talk to us. Yeah, sure, that's better. Yeah, well, I just threw it out there because I, I was kind of curious. I didn't hear anything happening with them there, and it seems like it would be, um, you know, very parallel, you know, theoretically should be kind of parallel to what's going on here. Um, so I was wondering if anything was happening with them there. Yeah, uh, for obvious reasons, I have been away and don't know, but I am in touch literally today with friends for different reasons in Cuba, and I can ask about that. Um, I suppose the thing that you're implying is, is are they contemplating a name change of that ce uh, cemetery? Right. And what might it be? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question. That, that cemetery is as, as essential there to, to Cuba and to its history, including the history of the, the revolution, um, as they are the monuments in Washington, D.C. for us. There's no question about that. that that's like Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, we, we have another question also from uh, Dylan, Dylan Williams. He says, uh, he asks, and you may have to put some context uh, for this, but what about the Estrada statue where only his shoes remain? <laughs> Good question. I mean, living in shoes, uh, I think, is is is, is brilliant. Um, and and you know, the, uh, wow. I, again, I don't have a lot of opinion. I I, I don't have a lot of uh, wisdom about this. Um, what do the rest of you say about that? Uh, let's see. I'm not uh, familiar with the, this statue. Is it literally just shoes? Um, just shoes. Um, yeah, okay. If I could just chime in, because I remember um, when I visited Cuba with Tom, we talked about this on the Avenida de la Presidentes, correct? Yeah. Where we were talking about how his he's controversial in the sense where 
he was able to secure Cuban sovereignty over places like the Island of Youth and a few other important harbors, but he was instrumental in sort of leasing Guantanamo Bay out to the United States. So I know that that's been very contentious because here on this island you have Guantanamo, which has like this famous black site. And it's strange because there's this war between Cuba and the United States and we accuse them of being authoritarians yet. Here we have this outpost of American imperialism on their island where, you know, we regularly break international law. It's like, so I, I found that very interesting, that whole dynamic at play, kind of returning back to sort of seeing Cuba as an extension of like U.S. imperial um, policy. So like, how do we interpret those people in the history? Were they really anti-Cuban or do they play a much more complex role in the history of the region? That's a brilliant, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant, brilliant uh, question, question, I think. I, I, I hear an echo, and I'm not sure why. You guys hear an echo? Yeah, I hear an echo. Uh, echo. Uh, I'll turn the speaker, speaker down. down. If, if, uh, yeah, yeah, a little, little better. better. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I, I'm just shouting you. Tom, Tom, every... every Everybody, Everybody should, should be muted. muted. Everybody, Everybody should, should be, be muted, muted except you. Everyone should be muted. Okay, let's see. Let's, let's, let's. That's why you're getting an echo. Some somehow everything became unmuted. I don't know how. Uh, so I'm. I'm okay. I'm just. Okay, okay. Are you good? We're, we're, we're okay now. I think. Sorry about that. Okay. So no, it's okay. So Dylan, just uh, it, very interesting. You seem to know a lot. Um, uh, you know, I, I knew, these movements that are so important for justice, right, often are necessarily, right, uh, they, they, <laughs> nuance is not their art. Um, nuance is often not a part of these kind of movements that we're undergoing now in the United States for obvious reasons. And I understand that when you're galvanizing a political movement, you're not making fine arguments, you're making bold arguments about racial uh, and gender and other kinds of justice. Um, so what I would say about uh, the Estrada de Palma, Estrada Palma is that, and his role, he was in a brutal position. And I, I discussed this in the Guantanamo book, I think probably more thoroughly maybe than it's ever been done. What, have, what the United States did to, to get the Platt Amendment passed, which gave them the right to this lease at Guantanamo Bay. And, and the, the man whose shoes sit there lonely without the man himself was put in a bad position. He may have, you know, sucked up to the United States according to the critics, but I'm just telling you that it was a vote. He, the, 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 the platinum was adopted in the Cuban Constitution by a Cuban vote. It won by one vote, and the United States said to Cuba, we will not leave. We will not end this occupation of you, which lasted two, two, four years, nearly four years, unless you adopt that, uh, that, the Platt Amendment into the Constitution. So I don't know what I would have done in his position, what we could have done in his position. It's easy to target these guys you know, from uh, you know, 130 years later. Um, but um, that's, that's one response. I, again, I'd be, I'm dying to hear other responses. Well, you know, we do have a, a few Cubans here. Uh, Dailelis, Daniela, maybe you can share some thoughts with us. Oh, hold on, let me unmute you. There you go. Hi, hi, everyone. Thanks for you to invite me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can yeah, you all of you? Daniela. Yeah. Just want to thank you for inviting me to this interesting meeting, and I didn't know. Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure about about how was it, I mean, was the meeting about exactly. And uh, I, fi I find it, I, th I think it's really interesting all, all what you are saying. And I just did the survey, just fill it up already. Yeah, and um, um, the question was, which is the, 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 the main fact uh, in the history of Cuba, which is more interesting for me, something like that. I'm sorry, I, I don't speak English quite well. I just, no, do, I just speak Spanish. That's my, you know, but, and, uh, and there was several answers and I, I had to choose one. 
and there was the revolution victory, the first one, and the second was the um, the war between Cuba, no, between Spain, Cuba, and 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 the United States. I can't remember right now. Maybe it was like that. And I think that that was the most, and I did. I mean, I, I choose that. I choose that one. That that was the most important fact in the history. I mean between the, the other ones, I choose that one. The war between Cuba, Spain, and, and, and Spain in the 19th century. Yeah, I find it more uh, important than for me that the Cuban revolution. Can I, can I respond to that, Tom? Sure, sure. Uh, Daniela, thank you. You speak uh, better English than I speak Spanish, so thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so, so you know, I think that you could make a good case for that. I, I started to say at the beginning of the talk that Castro knew this history. I mean, my history got interrupted right when I was talking about the history of the Platt Amendment. But mm -hmm. Castro knew this history like he knew the back of his hand. And it's not mm -hmm. a pretty history. Exactly. The U.S. has been yearning for Cuba for centuries, right? We, when Cuba was poised to get its independence, we intervened. We did not let them attend the armistice. We did not let them attend the, the, the Treaty of Paris. We forced the mm -hmm. Platt Amendment into their constitution. And then we've manipulated them ever since. The Platt Amendment was abrogated in 1934, but other means of manipulation were put there. And so Fidel Castro and other Cubans, all Cubans knew this. Yeah. You know, yeah. different Cubans had different interests tied to the United States and the U U.S. political and economic domination, but they all knew this, and this isn't a pretty history. Um, so I think that it's you, you, you're you're right to make the case for that. I think you know Fidel Castro wanted several things from the United States that he didn't get as a bare minimum. I call it the three R's: reciprocity, respect, and reconciliation. Uh, 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 sorry, recognition. Re reciprocity, oh, okay. respect, and recognition. He never got that. He was never treated as an equal. Cuban wasn't treated as an independent nation. Think whatever you want to think about that, but that's a fact, and Castro knew that. And those were the bare minimums of what he wanted to interact in a healthy way with the United States. He said, if you don't do that for me, I don't want to talk to you. Um, so, so I, I just want to pull up one more bit of a, of a screen share that, that um, to talk about Castro for a minute, can I, Tom? I don't know if, sure. uh, if you guys okay. want to hear a little bit about this, but no, so my ahead. idea was to ask of that book was to ask you guys to suspend this image you have of Castro, of this bothered, you know, finger pointing, howling, foaming at the mouth revolutionary. And then, and then to, to meet a different guy, and it's the guy that I talk about in that book, and so I'm going to pull him up again and show you a little bit about him that I was super interested in. The thing that doesn't come up on the screen is his absolute devotion to, to Cuba and, and to getting respect, reciprocity, recognition from the United States. Yeah. So here we go. You'll see a little bit about this. Um, actually, host. it says that the host disabled screen share. Oh, shoot. No, I'm sorry. I don't know why that happened. Hold on. Let me look for you. Uh, OK, it's OK. It's, it's, um, I, don't, I don't know why that. Uh, no problem. No, 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 no. Problem. There you go. Okay, there you go. You're all set. Okay. I don't know why that happened. Huh? Let's try it again. Okay, get okay. ready. So here we go. Okay, can everyone see that? So you saw these. I'll go past these these slides. So um, here you have. So here you have the guy on the left. The Castro with the beard that I'm trying to just sort of suspend. And then you, you, you have the guy on the right. And, and Castro is the one in the middle of that picture. He's a physics class at a very elite high school in, in Havana named Berlin, which has subsequently moved to Miami. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the guy, this super intense, very serious guy that I became interested in for reasons that I'll explain later, maybe. Um, that I wanted to that track and trace, recreate, recreate his life going forward, not from a position of moral superiority. And the book, I say, I say a bunch of things in the book, and I'll only talk about what you guys have time to respond. 
But I say there, there are essentially five things I want the world to know about the young Fidel Castro. That originally he was a liberal nationalist, not a communist. He grew up as a liberal nationalist. He became communist, I think, for instrumental reasons and then later came to believe it. But that's very specific. I say he's an idealist. The critics say, oh, he's in it for money and power. And I say that's absolutely nonsense. If he wanted money and power, he would have taken over his parents' huge farm, mm -hmm. huge plantation. And then I say he's an outsider. I won't address that now. I say he's an anti modern address it now. I say he's a barn burner. I'll show you a couple images of that. By that, I mean he's utterly uncompromising. You don't respect us. You don't recognize us. You don't give us reciprocity. We're not going to talk to you. Uh, and I think that he's justified in that. Um, so I don't know how many of you know this, uh, this, uh, this woman named Nadi Rabuelta, but she was a, 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 a friend and for a short time a lover of Castro. And she and he ex exchanged hundreds of letters when he was in jail after the Moncada attack. But look at this, this is just one letter that I think is super interesting and is sincere, right? He doesn't know that anyone's looking at this. He thinks it's just to her. She's sending him books and he writes this. He said, I have plenty of material for the study of the great contemporary political movements, et cetera, et cetera, but I have nothing on Roosevelt. I want information on him, his policy of raising agricultural prices, promoting and serving soil, credit facilities, debt moratorium, extending markets at home and abroad, in the social field, how he provided jobs, shortened the workday, raised wages, and pushed through social assistance. Castro was interested in these things. He looked around, he was, a, he was a child of privilege in a very isolated part, rural part of Cuba. And he looked around and he thought Cubans needed these things. And then he says in the same letter, I'm inspired by the grand spectacle of the great revolutions of history because they always significant triumph of things and by the welfare and happiness of the vast majority as opposed to a tiny group of vested interests. I keep thinking about these things, he writes Nadi Rabelta, because frankly, how pleased I would be to revolutionize this country from top to bottom. I'm sure that all the people could be happy and for them, I'd be ready to incur the hatred and ill will of a few thousand individuals, including some of my relatives, half of my acquaintances, right, from the Ecole de Belen, two thirds of my professional colleagues and four fifths of my former schoolmates. Um, I'll skip this one, but I can, I can share the, this with you later. So that's, oh, um, yeah, so actually, so, so, that, so that's the liberal nationalist. Um, here I have the idealist. He says to Gnadi in a different letter from the same period when he was in jail. My classmates, the children of humble farmers, generally used to go barefoot to school and they were very, wore very bad clothes. They were very poor. Most barely mastered the ABC and despite being intelligent enough, soon dropped out of school only to drown in a bottomless sea of ignorance and despair. None were saved from the inevitable shipwreck. Their sons today are repeating the cycle of their parents under the same weight of social fatalism. The kid was aware of this. I, I got to interview a couple of his old uh, schoolmates who were you know, literally in their 90s uh, when I toured um, the, the area where he grew up. And it's not people who interviewed him in interviews or were dragged out. They were rare people that I, I was able to, to, to uh, speak to for unusual reasons. And they all said that the kid really cared about this stuff, that he was kind, he was he was, he was upset when people didn't have enough. How many children would have liked to continue studying but couldn't, he says. Everything has remained the same for more than 20 years. Probably it's been like this since the Republic was born and indeed he's right. And it continues invariably the same without anyone seriously placing his hands on the state of affairs. We make ourselves the illusion that we have a notion of justice. Um, so that's, the, I'll stop here um, just to give you guys a time to respond. But he was going to do whatever it took then to make Cuba just. And he was getting a lot of interference, both from the United States and from the elites of his, uh, in his own class and in the Cuban government. The hour has come. This was in the guerrilla war when, it's, when, when things are really coming to a head. The hour has come to demand action, he says. If they don't heed the reasons or the sentiments, meaning the Cuban people, 
the middle classes, the people will, with wealth and resources. We'll force them to do their duty with our facts. We will burn down the island from one end to the other. We'll make the entire nation confront this choice. Either Batista is finished off or the country will be ruined and perish. So <laughs> let, me end this let me end this share. Um, this is the guy. This is the guy that I discovered. A guy that, yes, he became irate and then, you know, he became erratic and violent because he was angry. He had this vision of this idealistic vision. He wanted to do it. He thought it should be done. And then all these impediments came in and, you know, you could argue about what happened to him. <laughs> Let me pause there for a while and get some responses, some questions, but also some comments from you guys. I'd love to hear not just your questions, but your, your ideas. Anyone have any questions or comments? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll say something that I enjoyed reading in your book, Professor Hansen, was a story of, uh, you know, it speaks, speaking to, to what you say about this image that many Americans have about Fidel, I thought this was really interesting when as a 14 year old boy, he wrote a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And, uh, and he got a response from someone there in the White House. I, I thought that was really interesting. You just don't see this, that, that connection. People seem to think, well, Fidel just came out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> the kid had, um, the kid was so bold and, and interesting and really original. Um, he got a lot, you know, he wasn't a famous kid at that school. So this was at his school, you guys, in Santiago de Cuba. It was a second private school that he went to there. Um, he lived in a very rural part of Eastern Cuba called Biran. He thought could afford him to send him to the school. And he was a, really, he was a, um, a hick from the, from the countryside and he was treated as such. But he also, he was a very unusual kid, extremely curious, idealistic, as I said, looking out for other kids that would be made fun of or were beaten up, he would protect. And he would also do these incredibly brave, crazy things like write the president of the United States, asking for a $10 bill. <laughs> and he got, he got a response. The other thing I thought that was so interesting was that he was offering uh, the president of the United States you know, not just asking him for something, but also offering him something, which he said is, we have some very good minds in this country in the neighborhood outside my house. And I'd be happy to help you access those minerals and things like that. So um, yeah, he was unusual. He had, he, he had, um, he was daring, dare, a daring kid. Uh, anyone else, any, any questions? I think we have a question from Dylan. Do you see that? Professor, I see some chat. of it. Yeah, in the chat. Right, I'll, I'll read it to you. He says, uh, you said that Castro was quite familiar with the history of U.S. Cuban history. Uh, Marti, who penned Nuestra America, advocated for local institutions and a rejection of Yankee ideology. I find this connection paramount to understanding modern Cuba, but I was never taught that in my American history classes. If you wanted to talk more on that point, I would be glad to hear. So, so Dylan, um, I'm not sure what the point is, except for that I agree with you, the history of US human history. I mean, that's, that's where I was going. I, I don't know if you were here for the beginning of the lecture, but I began with the, this idea of, of the you know, US founding fathers, that the country, the country itself, its economy and politics, the well-being and tranquility, their words of its people, could only be guaranteed if we possessed Cuba and I don't really think we've ever given that notion up. Um, and I think that has, that has led to this lack of reciprocity, lack of recognition, um, lack of respect that Castro has detected forever. And my sense is that, that, that the sting of that, the, the failure of Americans to recognize the Cuban people as people equals of the United States, it's akin to what we do with African Americans and other uh, people of color in the country now. Um, ha really, I think, partly triggered Castro's move from some of the ideas that he espouses in this, in, in this talk to, to communism and beyond. I, I make an argument in the book 
um, and th I want to say this carefully so you don't misconstrue me, that so in 1959, Castro won the war way faster than he expected to win it. <laughs> And he, uh, uh, he was unable at the time to build the kind of political base that a victorious guerrilla war needed. You all may know the name Frank Pais, who was a marvelous organizer in, in, in what's called the Llano, the, the, the plains. The, Castro was up in the mountains, the La Sierra. Pais and others were organizing the political movement in, in the Llano, in the plains, in the cities. Pais was murdered. Right, by Batista's government. And when Baez was murdered, Castro lost really the person I think, maybe the only person that he respected as much as himself in this. And I'm saying that pointedly, knowledgeably, more so maybe than Guevara and all these other guys. Frank Baez was sensational, Castro respected him. But so when Castro won, there was not a political base capable of supporting this victory. And he knew it. In 1933, when the 1933 revolution crumbled into 1934, and then Batista actually began to come to power through the military, Castro was aware of that. What happened? He said that so-called revolution didn't have its own independent army, and it didn't have a political base. And he studied it, and he studied it, and he studied it, and he said, we will not make the same mistake. But then he won so quickly because the Batista military was so inept and their US enablers so inept that suddenly he, there he was in Santiago de Cuba in, in, in late December 1958, early 1959. And he was looking around, the US was already going to tr try and committing to, the, to overthrow him. And if you don't uh, know this, there's evidence in the book. We were already committed to his downfall, right? Before he even showed his, his real colors, uh, because we didn't want to free an independent Cuba. And so though desperate then for support, unable, uh, without, sorry, lacking of, he turned to the one political base that might be useful at the time to sustain him against the internal pressure from the elites, from the Cuban exiles and from the United States. And that was the Cuban Communist Party. And the Cuban Communist Party never liked him. They thought he was a, a putschist. They thought he was an amateur. They thought he was an idiot, to be honest. They thought he was a child, irresponsible. But they each recognized in one another a common interest. And so Castro made an alliance with them uh, that, that, that eventually right, allowed him to stay in power, you know, despite the, the, the record of what happened. You guys may know the name Max Lesnick. Max Lesnick is a friend of mine and was a friend of Fidel's who lives in Miami. He's one of the few Cubans who are respected on both sides of the, of the Florida Straits. Max went back to, uh, to visit Q, uh, Fidel in 1978. And he said, and Fidel said, Max, why did you leave? And he said, because I didn't like communism. And Fidel said, Max, what would you have done if you were in my shoes? And Max didn't say anything at the time, but now Max says to me, said to me, Fidel was absolutely right. It was the revolution or communism, right? If, 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 if he hadn't sided with the communists and their organization and their power and their, uh, their, their position in Cuban society, he says, we would have been overthrown. And that's how he looked at it. And Lesnick now, uh, a friend of his, a real revolutionary, a real liberal nationalist, thinks Castro was right. That's a mouthful. That's right. So responses, I mean, I know where time's almost up, but does that anyone, so yeah, there's a finger. There we go, let's see. Well, Tom, I just wanna say, I'm, I appreciate you inviting me and I'm learning a lot, but I'm totally woefully ignorant of, of Cuban uh, American history, but I'm wondering when when uh, when Castro couldn't get a hold of information on FDR, which should have been readily available in textbooks and other things in the 50s, in the early 50s. When when was he asking this question, and why why it was, was it that he was, it was unable 1954 to? And it, indeed, he did get it. Revuelta and many many others were immensely successful in providing Castro and his uh, peers an entire library of books, and so he did read about this. Oh. Um, yeah, he read voraciously. The guy was a, 
you know, whatever you want to think of Castro, the guy was absolutely voracious intellect. He was brilliant. I don't, you know, I've come across, I'm an intellectual historian by training. I come across a lot of smart people, past and present. Yeah. I don't think I've encountered more than one or two minds that have the, the, the reach and the depth of him. He was, a yeah. tr he was truly curious. Well, I, had, I have no doubt about that, but I was just wondering, when was it that he wrote that letter, I guess, to... 1954. Uh, April, April 1954, if I have it right. And it was after that that he got the information on, on uh, FDR? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Very good. Other questions? If not, I should put you guys out of your misery. <laughs> No, this, this, Hi, this is can, you, can you hear me? Yes, John, thank you. Yes, I can hear Hi. you. All right. Um, I, I apologize. I got tied up in something else and came in very late what, to what sounds like a great, interesting presentation. Let me, are you familiar with Lou Perez's Cuba as an Obsessive Compulsive Disorder? Have you seen that essay? Yeah, yes, Lou and I are, are fast friends. Okay. I'm pasting the link to it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a little out of date because it was written before Obama had made his fundamental change in US policy, but it's still a fascinating uh, cycle, social analysis of, of the integration of the issue of Cuba within all of American history and culture. So I just pass that on. It's on the it's on the uh, links yep. or on the chat rather. Um, I want to excuse me if this is redundant to what you said, or at least I want to pose to me what is the still unresolved question of Fidel's nationalism communism balance, and what what I heard you said I, I did hear you say I think is is very much true, but what I can't figure out uh, is how much um, his need to have a revolution, a Cuba that was independent of the omniscient or the, the omnipresent United States required him to create a rupture. Um, the, you know, I, cause I've done a lot of work with Vietnam. I'm very conscious of their dilemmas of relations with China and the 3000 years that they've been struggling to define themselves culturally and politically independent. Well, the Cubans have been doing that for 300 years. And the, the problem is, is when you're a small country sitting next to a big country, um, which is inevitably going, if there is no obstruction, um, if there's no state power uh, that consciously creates obstacles, um, the natural relationship uh, of the small to the big is really to be incorporated. Um, and, you know, obviously in the case of Puerto Rico it was direct political control. In the case of the rest of the Caribbean, um, it doesn't require direct political control to, to be dominated culturally and politically by the United States. And it's I mean, obviously, at certain moments in history, the United States will make that control overt um, when it feels threatened in Central America or other places. But in many instances, it never has to come to that point. It just has to be the natural desire. I mean, it wasn't just the Cuban bourgeoisie were somehow manipulated from the outside. It's that they wanted to have their kids go to the colleges in the United States. And they wanted to bring the culture that they regarded as somehow superior or more advanced. I mean, it's, it's a choice that Cuba in a sense makes. Um, one of its dilemmas in trying to free itself from Spain was how close it wanted to be to the United States. 
in this sense also that one of uh, what you get in Lou's essay is one of the uh, real strong motives on the American part. It was prepared to tolerate as unpleasant a uh, Spanish rule as existed, even though there was a lot of anti-Spanish sympathy in the United States all through the 19th century. But the United States was not prepared to see Spain collapse and leave Cuba wide open to anyone else. Uh, it wanted to be sure that it was the someone else. And ag again, you know, whether that's just part of what it means to be a big guy next to a little guy and a strong, uh, powerful economic and cultural force next to a weaker one is a, so how do you, if you're Fidel Castro and you're deeply committed to national identity and separateness, do you need obstacles? Do you need in a sense an embargo uh, to be able to have the space to do what you want to do, particularly when you have the option of the Russian subsidies to, to create the kind of country you want to create. Um, and it's, I think it's also the dilemma now is uh, that we saw, we began to see with Obama, and I think we will see even more so when Biden is president, is, is how much is Cuba prepared to let itself become close to the United States um, and what's the cost of that? Sorry, I, again, you may, I may be repeating or things you've earlier talked about, but that's what, what bit, little bit I heard triggers in my mind. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, th I, I think I, uh, this will be the, um, last, uh, so the last question for Professor Hansen. He, he has to, to go some. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, it seems like the um, the virtue of that question is in the posing. There's a lot going on there, more than I can possibly answer. We are supposed to finish at three. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just, I, I have to back out. Uh, there, uh, I take up a lot of that in the book, but I do like, I like this session. I think it's very interesting that, in fact, the embargo has actually helped rather than hindered. That's interesting. That has helped Castro's project. Uh, let me let me just say that from from the from the viewpoint of a of a, an uninformed uh, but very interested uh, bystander here, uh, given what John said about big and little and standing by, I just I just don't understand why when 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 Castro made his decision to stand with uh, to stand with with uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, um, with communism, uh, he, he realized that his towering force that, that lived next door to him uh, had been, you know, had gone for World War II and had, a, had a stood where it stood against communism. You know, yeah. why, why wouldn't he have, uh, you know, hesitated, I guess. I know he, I needed, he needed them to get, to get to where he wanted to go with, with the uh, with the revolution, but uh, it just seems to me that he was, I guess, unrealistic about how he could get the United States to to change course, uh, given given what they had else how, what else they had to deal with in the world and and where we stood against communism, whether our containment policy was right or wrong. It's we were there. That's all. Okay. okay well, so, um, Tom, I, I, I think we have to go. Yeah, I know you. I think you have to go. So, thank you very much again, uh, Professor Hansen, for your time and for your for your knowledge and sharing uh, your research with us. Uh, everyone, please read his books, uh, Young Castro or Guantanamo in American History. Uh, thank you again for your questions. Again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hansen. Our next section will, will be on August third with Fatima Largaspada. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Good Hi, to see you, Thank you. And, <laughs> and and Mr. Gormley. Great, great, good to see you. Good to see you. Where's the old man?